In our second reading today, we heard a portion of Matthew's gospel. It comes late in the gospel, and it is Jesus directing some teaching to his disciples. Now, these are primarily men who have followed him for a number of years through his public ministry. They have been listening along the way. They have been deepening their relationship with Jesus. He calls them his friends. They've witnessed miracles. Miracles of multiplying loaves, of healing the sick and exercising demons. They've seen Jesus challenge civic and religious authorities. They've even seen Jesus transfigured, appearing on a mountaintop with Moses and Elijah. They have heard him oftentimes speaking of the kingdom of heaven. And they have a question for him. Jesus, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Well, the very question itself reveals that the disciples lack a clear understanding of the nature of the kingdom of heaven. And I'll tell you, I am sympathetic. I have tried to figure out what is the kingdom of heaven, what is the kingdom of God, and I've had to reset my thoughts on any number of occasions. The disciples are called that day to reset their image of the kingdom of heaven. You see, their image seems to have grasped onto worldly aspects of kingdoms. They are thinking of the greatest in terms of those who have the most power, the most status, the most influence. And Jesus sets before them a completely different example of the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. He sets before them a child. And children in Jesus' day, culturally, they were of little or no account. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? You'll be surprised. They are people you would not even notice. Jesus calls the disciples. And disciples are merely learners, followers of him. So we count ourselves among that number. Jesus says, whoever becomes humble like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And as he always does, Jesus sets the example. He humbled himself, took the form of a human, came and dwelled among us to show us the way. So he gives us a positive example of how it is that we can become more faithful disciples by not seeking power and status, but by trying to be more like himself, humble, But he goes on with a warning. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were fastened around your neck and you were drowned in the depth of the sea. This is not a good thing. We don't want millstones around our neck. So we want to avoid putting up stumbling blocks.
what are the stumbling blocks in our world that are cast before us? Well, let me backtrack a little bit. I told you how my vision of the kingdom of heaven has had to shift along the way. And one of those shifts has happened in just the last few years as I felt a call towards a more missional focus to my faith. One focus not just on the lovely Evensong crowd or those people who show up in church on a Sunday morning, but recognizing God's mission to the wider world. And how can I be a part of that mission? And so I have found myself again and again encountering people outside of our pews, trying to understand, trying to learn, trying to live out God's mission with those people. Those little ones, people that are oftentimes not held in any account, people we don't even notice. And these are the ones who Jesus invites us to welcome, to reach out to welcome but how do we even begin when we aren't noticing them in the first place well, Martha and Scott and I and the synod delegates from St. George's and other synod delegates had an encounter with some of those of no account in our world on yesterday morning at Synod. We watched a documentary on human trafficking. Human trafficking, where people are taken against their wills from their homes, moved oftentimes across international borders across provincial borders from their city, away from all their friends and their families and their support groups, and they are exploited. We were reminded that Canada is a source country, a transit country, and a destination country for human trafficking. Children, women and men from Canadian communities and other countries are being exploited across our country, particularly in large urban centers. Although if you watch the news within the past month, someone was arrested in St. Catharines for being involved in human trafficking. Trafficked persons in Canada are being forced to work in the sex industry and in domestic service or as agricultural labor as well in other sectors like manufacturing and construction. Well, it's difficult to give numbers of people in Canada. A report from a national task force on sex traffic trafficking of women and girls in Canada notes that service agencies have dealt with 2,800 individual women and girls in a single year in Canada who had been trafficked for sex trade. Indigenous women and girls are especially at risk. In that video we saw a man in, a, in one of the high rises in Toronto saying in all likelihood Within three kilometers, there is someone locked up in a hotel room against their will in the sex trade. 
Women in particular are at risk. 93% of human trafficking victims are female, about a half of which are between 18 and 24, and a quarter of the victims are under the age of 18. These are victims which need to be found and cared for. But I'd like, if I could, to speak directly to the men for a moment. Let's speak openly and honestly. We learn a lot of things outside of our church walls. One of my learnings began, I think I was in grade four, when I discovered my first dirty magazine under my older brother's pillow. What I was doing under my older brother's pillow, I don't know. But I began to learn something that men are taught in so many different ways. That women are objects. As disciples, we are called to see everyone. If we speak of them as objects, it must be in the way that God would see them, as loving creatures, beloved by their creator. And if society has given us uh, something in our brain that makes us think of women as objects for our pleasure and our delight, I would invite us as disciples, as male disciples, to pray for God, to help us to see women and girls with his eyes as his beloved children. And that is something we need to speak out to others. If we have any influence on our sons and our grandsons, other boys who are still being influenced by wrong images in our society. As male disciples, it is our responsibility to take away those stumbling blocks that lead us in the wrong way. Ladies, please join in as I continue. Jesus says, take care that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you, in heaven their angels continually see the face of my Father in heaven. Another learning along the way. A couple weeks ago, I went to a wonderful documentary called Us and Them. It was sponsored by the United Way. And we watched a documentary filmed in Canada, in Victoria, that followed the lives of four homeless people over a 10-year period. They handed out Kleenex to us as we went into the film heartbreaking, heart-wrenching. But one of the learnings, and this is how it ties into these little ones, is that in the film, the psychiatrist who deals regularly with people in homeless shelters, it was his observation that he had never encountered someone in a homeless situation who had not experienced trauma in their childhood. And during a panel discussion that followed, Community Care, the YWCA, and Start Me Up Niagara in our own city expressed the same thing. When they meet these people and get to know them, find that universally 
they've experienced trauma in their childhood. Now, some of it is, is those natural life events that traumatize us. Deaths of loved ones. An injury. An illness. A mental health issue. But all too often, it is a trauma of abuse, of neglect, of bullying. Things that, if we are more attentive, we might find ourselves in a position to intervene, to make a change. When we serve at the breakfast program, I know to think of them as little ones, stunted or their growth and development set on a bad path in their childhood can help, can help us to serve. But a little good news. Jesus talks about caring for the little ones. He gives that example of the shepherd going after the one who is not noticed, the one who is lost, the one who has gone astray. In that video, Us and Them, a woman befriended these four homeless people and over a period of four years, you could see growth, you could see development, you could see change, you could see hope. And despite 50 years of homelessness, you could see people still blossom when they are found, when they are cared for. This is good news. This is the kingdom of God unfolding even in our midst. Unfolding through agencies and churches reaching out, offering friendship. beginning to recognize that those whom we serve are not all that different than ourselves, save for a bad bump along the road that set them off on a trajectory that you and I might have found ourselves on if we had been in their circumstances. Jesus gathers his disciples as friends to join with him as he inaugurates his kingdom of heaven among us in our world. This is a great invitation. Let us continue to sit at the feet of the master. But when he gets up and moves, let us also get up and move and follow his example that the world might come to know the hope that he has offered. Thanks be to God. Amen. The words to tonight's offertory hymn are found in your service leaflet and the choir will be leading it. You can join in as you become comfortable with the tune. <laughs> 